anyway, I know that we have a goal, I believe, to acquire 100 acres a year. Um, and to put things in perspective, the Trust for Public Land last year, we acquired a 57,000 um, piece of property in Montana that we paid $6 million for. We just acquired, as part of a conservation easement, with several people that are in this room, and this is a conservation easement, not even fee simple. It cost us $11 million for, 50, for uh, 94 acres that were protected. And on average, it's, it costs us between, let's say, 800000 for a wetland acre, which is extraordinary, to $1.2 million and upwards for a developable acre. And that sort of puts things in, puts things in perspective. And I know when Kate approached me and said, what do you think the threshold should be for the tech for land conservation per year? How many acres do we need to acquire? And I said, minimum 100. And I'm thinking in my mind, it's like $100 million. The state's got somewhere around the $20 million range statewide, green acres, a little more than that. And it's a, it's a goal, which I think is a good thing. And the public access piece is generally one um, site per year. And I think that's you know, more than achieved, and, and I'll jump right into um, the slides. But anyway, since 2009, there were, there were more than 250 acres that have been acquired for habitat um, preservation, and what I'd like to say now is for resiliency purposes, because there's no funding, unfortunately, in habitat protection, but there is a lot of funding, except for some of the great work that Lisa's um, funding, but for the most part, um, resiliency is sort of the buzzword that basically um, gets more dollars for land conservation these um, you know these years. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Okay. Um, we've had a number of stressors over the years. The Trust for Public Land in um, in two th in excuse me, nineteen eighty nine published a green print in cooperation with New York City Audubon called the Harbor Herons Complex or the Harbor Herons Green Print. And at that time, there were nearly 2,000 pair of colonial wading birds, six different species, nesting on a complex of about six islands and using the valuable habitat. There have been so many stressors and things that don't really make the radar in a significant way are um, Hurricane Sandy. How many people here know that aside from Steve and Venetia, that there were nearly, and John Sacco maybe from New Jersey DEP, that there were nearly 700,000 acres of oil that was spilled into the harbor. A lot of people know that? Few people know that. Not many. Um, those, those kinds of impacts really disturb and impair uh, wetland species, wetland acres, and they kill off spe you know, critical species in that food chain, um, in that great trophic link like fungalus, they destroy marshes, they impair um, the system in a really significant way, and, and we're not getting compens compensated to the numbers that we need, or are, um, or, or is that on anybody's radar in, in a more significant way? And DEC does a yeoman's job, as does DEP, New Jersey DEP, in helping to recover, um, you know, lost use through damages recovery, but it's generally not nearly enough. Uh, an emphasis on land and water conservation and stormwater management is, the is at the core of really all of the work that we do at the Trust for Public Land. We work to protect and conserve resilient natural systems that significantly reduce damage to the city and the state's infrastructure. Again, those are big buzzwords for being able to recover dollars um, for grants or, you know, or, or other means. Due to the devastation from um, the Superstorm Sandy events, the Hurricane Irene and other storm-driven events, while we've intensified our efforts to preserve land and protect clean water and natural habitat and in strengthen and strengthen the green infrastructure that can ensure public safety, reduce property damage, and safeguard really critical water, energy, and transportation systems during the storm events, while providing critical open space and habitat values for people and critters. In New York, we're addressing the looming crisis uh, with a conservation program to promote climate adaptation and create park-rich, resilient, climate-smart and sustainable um, in a sustainable region. Superstorm Sandy really dramatized the importance of preserving low-lying coastal lands. The Trust for Public Land has helped to protect more than 1,800 acres of coastal parcels in the New York Harbor region, um, you know, shown in this slide, that were flooded during the storm that absorbed significant storm and wave surges helping to protect um, adjacent homes and businesses. 
Our goal is to protect additional um, lands on this coastal waterfront. Did you see that? <laughs> Okay, um, that's, that's a plug to one of my spectacular partners. Anyway, um, you know, something that, 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 you know, I mentioned that we did a, a Harbor Herons complex, um, you know, report, and something that really isn't um, noted that, you know, that greatly is that Northwest Staten Island may be one of the great examples of how wetland systems and the land conservation that's been done um, over the years, coupled with some strategic uh, wetland restoration that's uh, been promulgated by Steve and others in his office, Venetia, and Carl Alderson, who's been in the room. And I had the privilege of working with um, several brilliant ecologists when I was at uh, New York City Parks. Um, is, is really a great success story here. On the other end of this outlet, it's a, a great little restoration that Steve worked on that I basically, during the whole process, said it'll never work, you'll never get the connectivity, there's impairments. When I came back, that's one of the first sites from Alaska that I looked at, I said, this is great, it worked. But anyway, on the other side of this, you've got, um, just to the east of this, um, the New York Container Port, which is Staten Island's largest employer on the Arthur Kill, and according to many, there was, um, during the Sandy events, um, an 18 to 20 foot surge in this particular stretch because of the pinch points where the Kill and the uh, Arthur Kill and Kill Van Call meet. Anyway, um, the teleport sustained tens of millions, excuse me, the New York Container Port built right up to the edge sustained tens of millions of dollars of damage. On the other side of this um, Old Place Creek property is Gothel's Bridge Pond, which was also acquired in cooperation with with New York City DEP, uh, DEC, I'm sorry, uh, New York State DEC, in 1991, I believe. Um, the Trust for Public Land acquired that. And just to the west of that is um, a huge mobile home complex, trailer parks. Virtually zero damage to those sites. Several hundred wetlands basically front the teleport, um, the Port Authority's Teleport International Communication Center, and just to the south of that is where the north of that is the second largest employer in Staten Island, a third, the Staten Island Hilton with the Staten Island Corporate Park. Zero damage to, um, you know, to, to that infrastructure. And it's fronted on one side by marshes and on the other side by um, the, the um, Sweet Bay Magnolia Preserve, which is a freshwater wetland preserve, and all those were hard respiratory program priorities at the time. Um, really, really crucial. We know that wetlands were able to attenuate storm surge through bathymetric resistance, bottom friction, dissipating energy, and reduction of surface winds. The exact attenuation value of the wetland values vary um, so greatly from one location to another. And again, it's based on bathymetry, it's based on topography and vegetation um, from one storm to another based on intensity, um, track and forward speed. However, um, it's, uh, you know, truly precise value is difficult to pin down, and it's even harder to generalize. And that was clearly, um, this is clearly like one of the great regional success stories. We don't know how these systems, as well as um, all the restoration work, you know, is going to um, fare given the projections of about a meter of increase in sea level rise over the next um, 30 years. Um, but we do know that we better build in sea level rise into all of our restoration work and you know we're continuing on this conservation um, edge. We were recently um, fortunate to were collaborating with Columbia University in Drexel and we just received about a million dollars to look at the infiltration rates of some of these systems and to see how some of these natural systems help to protect some of the economic values of the communities uh, that they front. Um, in a study that's going to be done over the next, you know, year to year and a half. Um, anyway. right, I'm, I'm going to just focus on two um, projects that were recently completed. Um, I had mentioned, you know, Pouch Camp. And I, Rosalie Siegel's here. I don't know if Chris Zeppi is here. Um, Chris, absolutely, you know, brilliant and wonderful to the core along with Venetia and her crew, we were able to raise $11 million over the last um, literally year and a half to protect 
a 94 acre stretch, which was a heart respiratory program priority, and just building on what Marit said before, that, you know, the fact that this sits literally at a ridge that basically supports serpentine soils and other sandy sub substrate that supports uh, some of the most ecologically diverse complexes that we have in this region helps to reduce the non-point source and if there had been 500 condos put in, in place here as they had originally intended, it would have promulgated additional um, flooding, but this is one of the sites that were, was acquired in collaboration with the Port Authority and the State of New York um, to help protect that. The North Shore Waterfront Park, also known as Heritage Park, and I saw Bill Ty here, we work very closely with the Port Authority who provided the lion's share of the funding for the acquisition, land conservation of that site, along with um, the, a site that became the first post-Sandy resilient waterfront park um, in, in the region, um, we're very proud of. It's really a terrific testament to you know, the collaborative effort and the Harbor Estuary programs. Um, you know, big prioritization. Um, this site can absorb several million gallons of stormwater, both surge driven. It's, it's, um, it's basically sitting on about 36 inches of gravel and soil. It's a former brownfield. Um, old Wissenbach Marina, and it's on Staten Island. It's one of the few working waterfronts remaining in the city. It's really a great, a great success story, and one of the the TECs that uh, we're proud to chalk off. Um, uh, I'll just sort of end here. Um, we recently completed in 2013 this green print, which was a HEP priority watershed that was completed collaboratively with. The Harlem River Working Group, which is a consortium of about 50 community based organizations, and it's a hallmark of all of our green prints, which is community engagement and public access. So, this 10 mile stretch of the Harlem River connects the Harlem River at the north to the East River and Long Island Sound to the south. And thank you, Don, for basically helping us with um, at least trying to. Um, secure some funds from another granting source that was um, earmarked for the Long, Island, uh, the Long Island Sound program because it does indeed connect to the Long Island Sound. The green print, which is written in both English and Spanish, made 23 recommendations, including restoration, land conservation priorities, and public access act, um, opportunities. And we worked um, fairly, um, about two years ago, on a, a collaboration with the Port Authority and New York City Parks to save, and you can see in the upper right hand corner, Depot Place um, Park, which was acquired um, and donated to New York City Parks. And then I'll just sort of end on projects on the horizon. We're working now on a Great Kills project in Staten Island and Hook Mountain, which is just north of, um, of the Tappan Zee Bridge, which is sort of in, in the range. But thanks so much.